I was playing in this group for three years, in the same universe as another group by the same GM. Two groups, sometimes affecting each other in-universe, and at the end was supposed to be the big conflict between the two groups. Of note, my party was arguably the more evil one. We've done some bad things, and we generally go our own way, which does set us up for the final conflict with the good group. Also, there's some strange homebrew items in our party, specifically a coat that allows us all to merge into one, each taking our own turns inside the body, moving slash taking actions, taking the greatest of AC, saving throws, and basically becoming Captain Planet, because this is a D&D Captain Planet reference. Okay. You guys remember Captain Planet? You're, you're all Zoomers. You, you, you don't know what Captain Planet is. You don't care about good, proper television about saving the environment. Go back to watching the dog from Paw Patrol beat up a homeless guy or something. Anyway, back to the story. At this final session, we're hanging out in a town we were building, when the big bad, GM-controlled NPC, appears with the other group. So it's us versus the other party and the GM's NPC. Also with the other party are four wizards that surround the battle arena, holding a shield up to prevent any of our allies from getting in. Notably, the DM would frequently use these NPC wizards to cast Counterspell at 9th level for the benefit of the other party. We kill their cleric, and the GM jumps in to decide that when one of us dies, they get a legendary action to do one thing, and he mass heals his party. Okay, fine. They kill one of us, and she heals us as well. During the fight, in a critical moment where an athletics check would decide if we lost, the GM decided to allow the other party to use their inspirations to make us re-roll the check. This has no precedent in the campaign. We've never used inspirations offensively. We rolled well enough anyway to win about four re-rolls, as the other party used their inspirations on our athletics check. And then, the GM said that he had been keeping track of the joke inspirations we had awarded to him throughout the campaign and he started using his inspirations to make us re-roll. So the GM is explicitly making us re-roll, using his inspirations to try to kill our party. We survive anyway. So then, we finally gain an advantage, revivifying one of our dead party members and polymorphing her to keep her alive. This was not counterspelled because the wizards had used their reactions. At the top of the next round, the GM tells us that a ring on the dead cleric's finger starts glowing. The GM-controlled NPC Big Bad, who is at the top of initiative, then retrieves the ring, and reveals to us that it is a ring of three wishes, which recharges every 100 years, which had elapsed just now. He, the GM, then uses the ring to wish for our party to be dead. After that, the GM and the other party gleefully describe how they use the other wishes to undo all the things we've done over three real-life years in this campaign. GM swears up and down he was completely unbiased, and it could have gone either way. While I was gone, the OP made some edits to this story, and I just now caught it, as I've been pretty busy lately, so sorry about the uh, month-long interval between videos, uh, let's get back to it. So the OP went on to answer some questions. Question number one, what happened after? The aftermath. This was two days ago. The only aftermath thus far is this post, and some rumblings between those of us that got flocked over. That campaign was the final session of the campaign. There are no more games to be played. Also, this session was held in person for most people. I was remote, so I don't have insight onto what happened when the call ended, but I doubt there was much drama, as we're all adults and we are long-term friends. Question number two. Was there no indication of this behavior before? None. He was a reasonable GM in all of our previous sessions. In his defense, he had only had to balance one party's interests before that time. It's my belief that the GM had attached his ego to this big bad NPC. As his explanation for the inspiration flockery when I confronted him was that he was mad that he had forgotten to counterspell the dying action of our party member. So to make up for it, he decided to allow the inspiration flockery and use his GM inspirations to try to kill us. He clearly felt he was on their team and was unable to act fairly when it came to his rulings. I can forgive a mistake like that, but to plainly deny it and pretend you were being completely fair made me lose a lot of respect for him. Number three. This is fake fiction. I wish it were. 
I was in disbelief. I will summarize here the arguments the GM gave for the unfair rulings slash ring. A. You had powerful allies, too. We had a Tarrasque and a Dragon that were trapped outside the shield. The GM justified his infinite counterspells by allowing us to make one attack per round with the Tarrasque or Dragon to a target of his choosing. This was never a factor. Additionally, we had a mage NPC with an initiative roll. But if we tried to have her cast a spell that was too strong, he said, I'm gonna rule that she doesn't know that spell. When it came to their allies, they acted autonomously at the GM's discretion. For our allies, the GM ruled that we didn't tell them we wanted help. So they were just waiting with their dicks in their hands until we specifically complained. There was a moment when the shield was down, due to the GM using his NPC wizards to cancel four of our high-level spells. The GM ruled that our dragon was flying too far away to get in to help us. B. You could have gotten the ring instead of them if you had done my plot hook! This one I find particularly ridiculous. Yeah, we didn't do the story the way you wanted, so the win ring is effectively our punishment. C. The Inspiration Flockery I mentioned this before, but the GM told me he was mad that he forgot to counterspell the dying action of our PC, and tried to make up for it by changing the rules to kill us. There was a myriad of other instances of bias displayed, but the session was like 10 hours, and I can't write everything that happened. Instances where the GM allowed the other party to redo movement, retcon their whole turns, and when it came to us, he forced us to stick with any mistakes we made. I should mention that when the ring first came out, the GM had began by wishing to heal their party to full health, including fully reviving the dead cleric. I was so fed up at this point with this mountain of bullshit, I said, why don't you just wish us to be dead at this point? My other party members were on the same page. So, the GM did so. The GM was and had already decided who was going to win and it was a foregone conclusion. Again, I've lost a lot of respect for him, and won't be playing with him again. I believe he had a responsibility to us as players, and he completely flocked us over for the interests of his self-insert big bad. Wow. Something tells me that this GM is completely full of shit. Not sure if it's the fact that he dropped a ring of do whatever you want to the other party, magically in the hands of the other team's cleric, or when he allowed inspiration jokingly given to the GM to be used for realsies. But to then explain yourself, only to tell your players that this was a fair and balanced encounter? Yeah, I think that's what might have done it for me. Man, if only some deus ex machina could pop out of nowhere so I could do something about this game master. Oh, what's this? Why, it's a ring of three wishes! Well, as for my first wish, I wish I was the most handsome bird on YouTube. Oh, it didn't work? Must already be true. Uh, anyway, for my second wish, I wish that this GM got sucked into the void from which they will never return, trapped forever within the boundless reaches of the negative energy plane. And as for my third wish, uh, let's keep it simple. Maybe a proper introduction. My name is Jacob Crow, and welcome to the Crow's Perch where in addition to sewing myself in an underground bunker surrounded by an army of well-trained Pokémon, armed with miniguns and anti-air cannons to avoid having to finish filing my taxes, I also narrate stories regarding my favorite hobby, forcing animals to fight each other to the tabletop role-playing games. And so, without further ado, let's gather up a murder and dive into today's stories. In a desire to play D&D with an older rule set, I created an advertisement on Roll20 and r slash L of G, and collected some amazing folks and one problem player. I'll call Paul. Paul didn't last to see Session 1, despite a mustering of my patience and a philosophy that everyone can play. I had set our first monthly session just after the new year. This gave us about a month and a half to get to know each other over a Discord server I had set up. This was my second tabletop RPG Discord server, so by this time, I knew what I was doing. I had a general channel and also ones for character building, the setting, rules, Roll20, and a few roleplay channels. Each person also had their own private channel with the DM, me. Now, I am a computer scientist. Every channel was well named, and descriptions of the channel filled in. I even posted and pinned a guide on channel usage. 
being clear on some in-character and out-of-character channels. And it was good and well-followed by everyone except Paul. About once every few days, I would wake to find half of my channels lit up with new messages, all from Paul. At best, these were difficult to understand, to almost nonsensical. Often there would be pictures of Paul, or a view outside his window. Sometimes he left voice messages in and out of character. A few times, links to random songs would be posted. I privately explained the channel's purposes, and Paul said he understood. But a few days later, nothing changed, as another spam attack hit us. I went specific on an explanation of what I was looking for, and that caused a very odd change in behavior. For example, in the strategy channel, he would post whatever random thing he wanted, but awkwardly include the word strategy somewhere in the message. This was the underlying constant frustration in working with this player, but there were other strange issues. Like, constantly posting the season and year, constantly tagging people in messages, had so much confusion and questions around time zones, which both Roll20 and Discord mitigated automatically, that he missed Session 0, in-character roleplay by post, often stepped out of the player's domain, into the DM's area. For example, saying, I have written to the king, and he has responded with gifts, and impossibly high-rolled stats, backstory with ridiculous aspects, and finally, recruited people to join without asking. This was problematic, because the table was full. I realized I was spending more time managing this player then I was preparing to deliver fun for the rest of the group. At this point, I tried to do the adult thing and spell it out for him. I need you to use clear and appropriate communications, follow rules and guidelines, keep to your side of player and DM lines, and help keep the shared fiction instead of wrecking it. This led to a long, confusing, bizarre discussion that I'll not post here. He eventually only saw this as discrimination by me of his country he was from, and nothing else. There was nothing he could work on to better fit with the group at all. When he posted that he was done being patient with me, I concluded I felt the same way, and removed him from the game. I did not do this lightly. The remaining group members are awesome, and we enjoy a lively play-by-post, along with one live virtual session that couldn't have gone better. Epilogue. I heard through others from some of the groups we were in, that he started a Discord and Roll20 VTT of my same name, and used my Session Zero mini-scenario almost word for word. Ironically, the person he recruited turned out to be a great guy, and eventually took Paul's place. So, that worked out. Edit. There was no language barrier. We both only spoke English. He was about the age of the group, which was around 40 to 55 years old. Just based on how weird this player's responses have been, I would have immediately assumed that there was some kind of language barrier if the OP didn't point out that they were both communicating in English. This was just such a bizarre story about an equally bizarre player. Like, were they trolling? But how could they be if they invited a player who actually ended up working out? Was he senile? Was he just shouting everything in this play-by-post into speech-to-text while he was cutting people off in the freeway? This man is just an enigma to me, and I think I just need another story, so let's just move on before his brain worms digitally transmit. This happened long ago, playing Dark Heresy, Warhammer, with IRL friends. The GM wanted to do a more down-to-earth campaign, having us make Arbites, police, characters, rather than the typical inquisitorial agents fighting the supernatural. We realize early on that the big bad is a noble who has vast resources and knowledge. He's also really slippery, and we struggle to get any evidence of any actual wrongdoings. The campaign goes on for months. We end up following blind leads a lot. Some sessions we made no progress, but we continue on with the investigation either way. At one point we have a huge action scene, and some of us die or are maimed taking months in-game to recover with cybernetics. Generally in the campaign, we each had two to three characters die to various combat scenes, which we were used to in the Inquisitorial campaigns, but hoped it would be better in this one. We were told the investigation is time-sensitive, so we're getting a bit worried. The second-to-last session comes along, 
and we have my character at a place where it's playing a fine line between helping the Arbites and helping the Big Bads to get information. I meet with Big Bad's right-hand man and convince him we got to work together to take down Big Bad. We didn't discuss specifics, but we'll figure it out next time. Last session rolls in, and the GM explains that we have a meeting with Big Bad. It's a bit alarming, but not the first time. We go to his mansion. In the main hall we enter to see Big Bad, next to him is beaten to shit, right-hand man. Big Bad monologues how we figured out all my plans, and now it's time for me to die. He grabs my head and crushes my skull. No saves, just death. The GM went on to unpack the plot, as no one understood what was going on. Apparently, GM went and had right-hand man try and betray Big Bad right away, and between sessions, rolled a lot of checks to see how it plays out. But he got caught, and Big Bad learned everything of his betrayal and my character's involvement. Big Bad was also, apparently, on some Giga-Chad drugs we never figured out and was basically a mutant at that point. He explained the damage breakdown, and that even if he rolled minimum, it would be so much damage that it counts as instant death. This was the start of the session, and the rest was very awkward, as we had to play out our game over, the world is ending scenario, or we found out more and more about how badass the big bad was. Edit. GM ruled being attacked during speech counts as a surprise round. No fate burn was allowed. Had four available. For those of you who are new to the channel, let it be known that I am a huge Dark Heresy fan, and it was one of the first game systems I had ever played, and the first one I had a long-term campaign spanning multiple years. Though the true horror of the 40k setting is most exemplified by the fact that Fantasy Flight Games made an investigation game and filled it with nothing but combat rules. But as for mistakes made in this campaign, where do I even begin? Well, let's start off with the Fate Point debacle. So, Fate is a mechanic that turns you from the cosmic ashes left over from the remains of Tanith to the near godlike immortality akin to the likes of Siophis Cain. Think of it as a resource that you have points you could then spend to allow failed rolls to succeed, to allow you to crit on your successes, and a bunch of other stuff. They usually recharge at the beginning of the next session, and can sometimes recharge even in the middle of a session if you do good roleplay or have a really badass moment. However, rules as written, you can permanently remove one of your fate points for the rest of your character's lifespan to allow yourself to live through a fatal situation. And the rules about this are pretty open. Were one of the examples in Death Watch, another 40k game by the same company, has as an example surviving being trapped on a spaceship during a warp drive implosion. Suffice to say, you can use it to survive basically anything. So while these are notoriously deadly games with a notoriously deadly setting, much like that setting and all of its supplemental material, that deadliness only seems to apply whenever the author decides it does. So long as you have fate points, rules as written, you can completely survive a fatal wound and miraculously survive, only to be found years later in a lush garden world called, um, uh, Tahiti. All this to say, yes, this GM made a terrible ruling. And by outright removing a mechanic like this, you get rid of a lot of the pulpy feel of 40k. If this GM really wants that kind of grimdark, just play Morkborg or something. Hell, even D&D 5e at low levels is more brutal than this. If I roll up a level 1 wizard with 9 constitution, in one bad roll I can die instantly and have my guts pulled out from my urethra in a chance encounter with a giant rat. There were so many other problems with the GMing in this story, but I've gone on for long enough. But thank you for joining me for today's stories. And if you like today's stories and would like to see more of them, then feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave a like on this video. Likes are really good for my ego, and subscriptions are even better, because then that means more people are going to find my videos and watch them. So that's pretty cool. And if you made it this far, why not leave a comment? Can't think of a comment? Then leave the comment, Crow talks about Dark Heresy again. My mind is in a warp storm, swirling in endless agony with how much Dark Heresy I've played. I'm dying. Please send help. Anyway, there's a bunch of names floating on screen right now. These people are my patrons. This insanity is sponsored by them. So if you like stories and you like me reading them, then be like these patrons here and give me money. Give me money now. Like my counts of quills. Like Fairy Fire, Just Monica, Critical Kunick, Shep Dog, Evix, King Drazil, Christian Pip, Cosmosis, Haley Thompson, 
Zero Fang, and Netscape Navigator. In the grim darkness of the 41st millennium, people who have only been in the hobby for like two years are calling other people tourists. Don't go on Twitter, kids. It's just love the emperor. <laughs> like Spoogy, Archangel Nuriko, Easy Cece, Kioni, Jonathan Fenton, Miss Tiger Beans, New Haven RP, Kieran Slater, Running Bear, Haley McAuliffe, Brittany Mars, Spectre Spark, Ars Torok, Ghost Legan, The School Bus, Kuntos Weasel, Cardispawn, Lord Rend, Wormy, Den of the Drake, McEatley, and Anya. One of my characters in an old 40k campaign talked like this, and his name was Falcon. It was like 40k meets Metal Gear. It was it was pretty fun. But anyway, I'm going to use that voice to introduce the Dukes of Feathers. Like Apocalypso, Repetitive Debug, Xeno Cruise, Fable and Flourish, Angrad, Grunt, Kive Mind, Squishy, Jarrett Sewer, and Matthew Melquini. And with all that out of the way... I will see you next time as the crow flies.